thing for all the construction workers and anyone who's, who's been involved in the project. Uh, I think everyone will walk away from this one with a, a sense of pride. And I think that's one of the things I'm probably most proud of is this amount of work that went into every decision. It's just good to be a part of this. You know, this is, this is a job of great magnitude for the city of Pittsburgh, like I said, and for the Penguins. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. I had a construction worker come up to me a couple weeks ago and he said he'd been walking the building trying to find a bad seat and he hadn't found one yet and I don't think he will. It's a lasting monument and it's turned out so beautifully. Uh, I'm so happy for Pittsburgh and um, it's just going to be a wonderful place for entertainment and for the whole community so I feel really, really, it's a really special feeling for me. For the past two years, construction crews along the Fifth Avenue corridor have been working on Pittsburgh's newest crowning jewel, the Consol Energy Center. But while the building itself may only be a few years old, the road to this architectural and technological wonder goes back over a decade. When Ken Sawyer took over the Pittsburgh Penguins in 2003, he realized that both the team and the city would need a new facility to carry them into Pittsburgh's new age. Sawyer was determined to make it happen. You know, there are a lot of obstacles in the way early on. The um, league had its issues with uh, fixing the economics. That took a long time. We had to get through that before we could really address seriously an arena deal. Um, and then we had to find the uh, financing for it. Very difficult in these days. And, uh, but we were able to do all that and the fans were great for us. They certainly sent the message loud and clear that uh, they wanted the Pens here forever and we were happy to oblige. The Penguins made good on their promise and on March 13, 2007, Penguins owner Mario Lemieux made the announcement that so many people had waited to hear. Tonight, I'm proud to announce that your Pittsburgh Penguins will remain right here in Pittsburgh where they belong. Thank you, Pittsburgh. Have a great night. With a deal finally in place, Sawyer and the Penguins began the process of making the dream a reality. It would be a daunting task. Well, I certainly knew I had to bring a team to the table to, um, in, in all aspects. It was a team effort to um, negotiate the deal. It was a team effort to design it, to, um, uh, to manage the construction process. Uh, and so one of my early tasks was to put the team together. And um, we had an excellent team. And that really made a difference. This arena is being built on time, on budget. And it's uh, got everything I could ever want inside it. So I'm very pleased. One of the first things the Penguins did was to bring in Pittsburgh native David Morehouse to help spearhead the Penguins' bid for one of the state's new casino licenses. David's expertise in politics and governmental issues would be an asset in the bid process. I, I, I got here in 2005, beginning of 2005, and there were already plans uh, for an arena on this site, uh, but we didn't have a mechanism for funding the arena. Uh, so we, we embarked on a strategy on, on trying to find a way to, to figure out funding for a new arena. Uh, we had come out of bankruptcy a few years prior. Uh, the league was in a lockout. We didn't have the financial means to pay for the construction of a whole arena ourselves. There were three applicants for the gaming license. The other two decided that they too were going to help fund the construction of a new arena. So in essence, the Penguins and the city of Pittsburgh would win no matter who won the license. We met with the governor, uh, the mayor, Ravenstahl, and county executive Honorado, and we crafted a deal for, for the funding. Once that deal was struck, then we started construction. As with any construction project, the first step is to get all of the ideas onto paper. After considering their options, the Penguins contracted an architectural company called Populous to draw up the plans for their new facility. Kurt Amundsen was one of the architects who worked on the arena from the beginning. There are certain steps you, you take at the beginning of the project to really establish some fundamental design principles that are, those steps are pretty common from project to project. 
we get a sense for the community that the project's going into. We conducted a design charrette like we did here back in June of 2007. This building was essentially built in 3D on a computer. Every pipe, duct, speaker, light, seat, everything was built in 3D. Of course, initially there was all, all kinds of conflicts that happened, but have that happen on a computer and be able to fix it and relocate things and get it coordinated than to have it happen in the field. So that saved a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of headache during the construction process. Projects of this size and, and of this building type, they're very complicated. Um, and as the design gets rolling, they become fast moving trains. And it's important to keep going back and making sure um, that you're staying true to your design principles and, and keeping that train on the tracks. While the architects continued to draw up their plans, the Penguins tapped an unusual source for some design inspiration. Interior designer Christine Astorino was asked to develop a motif that would make fans feel like they were watching the game at home rather than in a massive arena. We would go to games, night games, day games, kind of camp out before the game, during the game, after the game take photographs and really understand, secretly spying on all the fans, but understanding how it is that they, they truly wanted to experience the game. With a direction in place, the project quickly branched out into several directions. To help manage the overall direction of the construction, the Penguins reached out to Icon Venue Group, a project management firm specializing in sports arena and stadium development. Really our first initial engagement was really working with both the Penguins and the Architect Populous to really try to identify the program uh, for the arena. Some of the more basic things, number of seats, number of suites, you want to have club seats, you want to have loge box seats, you know, in proximity down on the event level where does, where does the Penguins area want to reside, what do we need for concerts, office space in the media department, the sponsorships, season tickets, the operational side of it, the concessions. So we were trying to herd all those different groups, understand their needs and wants, and then put that into the ultimate design of the facility. Local construction company PJ Dick teamed up with Hunt Construction to form what would be the backbone of the workforce. But it would be six guys in business suits who would kick off the entire process at the ceremonial groundbreaking on August 14, 2008. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time and making the effort to be a part of Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania sports and entertainment history. Until we announced this deal, I couldn't come to the city of Pittsburgh and march in a parade or even walk from a restaurant to my car without somebody yelling at me about saving the penguins or creating the arena. And it left an indelible impression on me. Okay, guys, dig in. With construction officially underway, the crews eagerly dove into the first stages of development. When you begin a project, you start with the deep foundations, uh, the excavation uh, foundations, uh, concrete walls, and that's followed up by structural steel, uh, uh, concrete on decks, precast, that type thing, and you start the exterior. <clears throat> the thing that's exciting though, each one of those are a job within itself. As, as you're doing those, you see people come who are going to be performing those activities, complete their job or that activity and move on. And then a new group, group of faces come on. Uh, through the project itself, uh, we have a, a, an orientation program that everyone needs to go through whenever you come on the project. Thus far we've had just about 2,100 employees come through that have worked on the project. So uh, uh, a lot of new faces, a lot of people who come, a lot of people who go, and there's really only a few who have been here through, for the whole duration. But as people came and went, chances are they didn't have a long drive home, as most of the labor force came from the Pittsburgh region. Each individual package was competitively bid. Uh, most of the successful bidders were local contractors. Uh, there were some contractors that were from out of town, uh, and they performed well on the project as well. And whenever they came to the project, they came with supervision, but hired locally regardless. So uh, it was a benefit to the city and the region all around. Given the size of the arena itself, the crew had to come up with creative ways to reach their destinations early in the project. Yeah. 
But if there was one crew member whom everyone depended upon to get their jobs done, it was lift and elevator operator Bill Carmack. All righty, on one. On seven, this is seven, coming out. Thank you, Bill. Yes, sir, Joe. Typical day is hectic. Maybe we can just do this once I get him. Come on, guys. Up and down, up and down, up and down. With seven floors of work and only one elevator available, Bill's six by five office was a hive of activity. I have to deal with maybe five or 600 different personalities, and that's not an easy thing to do. But most of the guys here are pretty good guys. They're professional, and they're union, and they're good workers. So that makes it a little easier. Uh, one, please. Service level. Elevator's going down. Who's going down? So you hit. Yeah, I'm going to seven. All right, I'll get this over here. You going to take that down? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll be right back. Down on three. Just missed me, three. Hang tight, three. I'm on one, Bill. Got you in the basement, got you on one. Going up. Well, a lot of people think that running an elevator is easy. But like I said, because you have to deal with so many different personalities, most of the guys that come in this elevator, I know what mood they're in when they first come in. I know when, whether to say hi or whatever. And I know because it's, I've been knowing them for a while. Up and down, up and down, up and down. That's every day. And how are you feel? Feel pretty <laughs> good. <Kind of. laughs> so you're looking forward to your, your mind. You're probably already down at the beach already, huh? Yeah. yeah. When are you supposed to be leaving? Uh, August 1st. The guys that I work with, the importance of this job, not only for the Penguins, but for the city of Pittsburgh, and that I was a part of that. And that's the same thing I'm gonna tell my kids and my grandkids. This building's gonna be here for a long time. I wish I could just put my name up there somewhere. <laughs> With all of the manpower being poured into the project, the Penguins asked Travis Williams to oversee the project from the Penguin side and to act as a liaison between the team and the project managers. We had uh, several meetings and had the right people at each of those meetings, just communicating about issues that would pop up, making sure we address them quickly, uh, made sure that we under everybody understood what the issues were around the table, made sure we had the right experts at the table to help us address, address those issues, and then quickly communicated the, the decision of the solution, and then it got out in the field and, and was corrected quickly. One of the issues that the construction team faced was the shape of the site itself. While the plot of land was more than big enough to accommodate the arena, it was also on the side of a mountain. From the highest point to the lowest point is almost 90 feet of change in elevations. So it was really kind of a trial and error. We just kind of went through a lot of different iterations, looking at how things were laid out, how they were going to be oriented on the job site. And then ultimately we came up with, with this. I think it works really well. I like having the three distinct entrances into the building at three different levels. Another issue facing the workers was the glass structure on the west side of the building, known as the spine. Intended to be the architectural signature of the building, the organic design of the frame presented some interesting challenges for the crew. Uh, challenges start right at the beginning in the foundations. Uh, the location of, because it is a spiral and it's not a straight line, uh, you start with the caissons and then follow that with the foundation walls and there's not a straight line in it. On top of that, you're setting structural steel, which are round columns. Uh, very little structural steel tying into it, so it made it challenging to plumb. When you're plumbing the steel, that's critical because the glass needs to fit within those areas. And from that point forward, we installed the, the mullions and then the glass. The glass, there's 740 sheets over there. I think it's interesting that whenever we were installing the glass, after we installed the first uh, six or seven pieces, we broke a piece and we thought this wasn't going to be good because of the amount of waste you're going to have at, at that percentage. Uh, through the balance of the erection, they only broke another piece. Uh, Universal Glass, they did a very good job. So, uh, I enjoyed the spine. The rest of the building really spins off of, of the spine. Um, at its highest point, it's 100 feet from floor to ceiling. When the fans come in from the southwest entrance, they're going to be exposed to this enormous volume of space. It's flanked on the west by the curving curtain wall that really opens up to the, the, the backdrop of the, the city skyline. Um, the concourses, all three main concourses on the, on the east side of the spine will open into it. Um, it's going to sort of form as a foreground to the views to the city, so that's really dramatic. Another unique feature to the Consol Energy Center is its small environmental footprint. In fact, 
The building is so eco-friendly, it will be the first arena to receive a LEED Gold certification. It's a sustainable design. It means that the, uh, we're using materials within the building that are recycled materials. It means that the, there's a particular indoor air quality that is available within the building. Uh, uh, there's uh, economies in the type of systems that we're putting in place. The ma majority of the materials need to be within a 500 mile radius of the city, so most of it was local material as well. One of the features that is less dramatic and hopefully people won't notice a lot is the roof structure. Um, it's one of the lightest weight, most efficient roof structures of its kind. It spans 336 feet and it does that with basically only four trusses that are deeper than 12 feet. Everything else is, is a lightweight structure. All the way up to the type of roof we have. We have a, a white rubber, rubber roof on that's for reflectivity and so it starts at the bottom and goes all the way to the top. In spite of its green design, the Consol Energy Center doesn't disappoint on shiny toys and flashing lights. In fact, the technologies available to fans in the arena are second to none in the world of sports. In the, the, the American Eagle entryway, we have the three video pucks that we've designed, which will add some video exposure. In the trib entry, uh, we have another large 80-foot uh, long video board. Uh, that will provide some great theming and branding to our building as well as telling people about upcoming events. 880 televisions in the building uh, which will provide us with IPTV capability. One of the other major things that the fans are going to notice obviously is the scoreboard behind me. It's four-sided scoreboard. Each side has a 15-foot tall by a 25-foot wide Mitsubishi Diamond Vision high-definition video screen. The first day they started construction pretty much came to a, to a grinding halt um, with a, about 300 construction workers standing around with their mouths hanging open. It, it's, it's really impressive that the sound that's going to complement the video system in here is, is truly going to be second to none. Second to none is going to be a very common phrase when it comes to the Consol Energy Center. And it has been a long time coming. After years of debate and back-breaking work, the people of the Pittsburgh region have a wonderful new arena to call home. So to see what we see now uh, compared to what was here before, and, and it doesn't seem that long ago when we were just trying to fight for this thing uh, and, and cement our future in Pittsburgh, it's just amazing. Um, as a whole, the construction team really goes above and beyond almost on a daily basis to really do what's right for the project and deliver a quality facility that, that Pittsburgh deserves. Thank you for your support while we did the necessary to rebuild the team. Thanks for your support when we uh, needed you when we were doing the deal for the arena. And I would say to them, enjoy. This is a wonderful testament to the region, to them themselves, the fans, and there's going to be a lot of fun and excitement.